5. Some of my more perceptive readers are probably thinking that Naomi and I were already more than just friends. We weren't though, in fact. It's true that a sort of unspoken understanding developed between us as the months went by. But not only was she still a girl of 15 and I a scrupulous gentleman who had had no experience with women, I also felt responsible for her chastity, so I didn't let the impulse of the moment push me beyond the bounds of our understanding. Of course the notion had gradually taken root in my mind that Naomi was the only woman I could ever think of marrying, and that even if there were someone else, I couldn't abandon Naomi now. This is another reason I didn't want to make the first move frivolously, or in a way that might hurt her. It was in the spring of the following year, April 26th of Naomi's 16th year, that our relationship entered a new phase. I remember the exact date because around that time, no, it was when we began to use the wash tub, I started a diary in which I recorded everything about Naomi that caught my attention. Her figure was growing strikingly more feminine every day. Like a new parent who keeps track of his baby's development with entries like, laughed for the first time, or, spoke for the first time, I wrote down everything I noticed. I still leaf through it now and then. Here's what I wrote on September 21st in the fall of Naomi's 15th year. At 8pm. I bathed her in the wash tub. She still has her tan from the beach. She's very dark, except under the bathing suit. I'm dark, too, but Naomi has such a light complexion, the contrast is sharper. Even when she has nothing on, you'd think she was wearing a suit. You look like a zebra, I said. She laughed. About a month later, on October 17th, I wrote, Her tan is fading and her skin doesn't peel anymore. It's even smoother and lovelier than before. When I washed her arms, she watched quietly as the soap bubbles dissolved and ran down against her skin. Beautiful, I said. Yes, isn't it? She said. Then she added, I mean the soap bubbles, you know. On November 5, we tried using the western tub tonight for the first time. Not being used to it, Naomi slipped and slid around, shrieking with laughter. When I said, big baby, she called me, papa. After that, we sometimes called each other, baby, and, papa. She always called me, papa, when she was trying to coax something out of me. Naomi Grows Up, was the title I gave my diary. Of course I only wrote about Naomi. Before long, I bought a camera and photographed her face, which was looking more and more like Mary Pickford's, in different lighting and from various angles. I pasted the photos here and there among the diary entries. But the diary has taken me off the subject. According to the diary, she and I began a deeper relationship on April 26th of the year after we moved to Amori. Because of our unspoken understanding, it came about silently and spontaneously. Neither of us had taken the initiative, and we hardly exchanged a word. Finally she put her mouth to my ear. Joe, gee, don't ever leave me. Leave you? Absolutely not. You don't need to worry about that. I think you know how I feel. Yes, I do. How long have you known? Let's see, how long has it been? What did you think of me when I said I'd take care of you? Did you think that I intended to marry you eventually? Yes, I thought that's what you had in mind. Then you agreed to come because you were willing to be my wife. Without waiting for her answer, I hugged her with all my might. Thank you, Naomi, thank you. You understood. I'll be completely honest now. I never thought that you would come this close to my ideal woman. I'm so lucky. I'll always love you. Only you. I won't mistreat you the way so many husbands do. I live for your sake. Go on studying and grow up as a fine young woman, and I'll give you whatever you want. Oh, yes, I'll study hard. And I'll be the sort of woman you want, I promise. There were tears in her eyes, and I'd begun to weep, too. We talked all night about the future. Shortly after that I spent a weekend at home and told my mother all about Naomi. There were several reasons for reporting to her quickly. I wanted to reassure Naomi, 
who seemed to be concerned about my family's reaction, and I wanted everything to be out in the open. I told my mother my ideas about marriage and, in a way that would make sense to an old woman, explained why I wanted to marry Naomi. My mother had always understood and trusted me. She said only, if that's what you want, then you should marry her. But if she's from that kind of family, there might be trouble in the future. Be careful. We decided to wait two or three years before announcing our marriage publicly, but I wanted to have her officially registered as my wife right away. I went to Senzoku to negotiate with her mother and brother. As before, they were nonchalant and everything went smoothly. They may have been a little negligent, but they weren't bad people, and they didn't say anything to suggest that they were motivated by greed. Our relationship evolved rapidly after that. No one knew of the change yet, and outwardly we were just friends. But legally we were now married and had nothing to hide. Naomi, I said one day, let's go right on living together like friends, shall we? Then are you going to go on calling me, Naomi? Of course. Or shall I call you, wife? No, I wouldn't like that. And will I always be, Joe, G? Naturally. What else would I call you? Naomi lay down on the sofa with a rose in her hand. She pressed it to her lips and fingered it for a moment, then said suddenly, Joe, G. Opening her arms, she dropped the blossom and embraced my head. My darling Naomi, I gasped from the darkness under her sleeves. My darling Naomi, I don't just love you, I worship you. You're my treasure. You're a diamond that I found and polished. I'll buy anything that'll make you beautiful. I'll give you my whole salary. That's all right, you don't need to. My English and music lessons are more important. Oh, yes, yes. I'm going to buy you a piano soon. You'll be such a lady, you won't even be ashamed to mix with Westerners. I often used phrases like, mix with Westerners, and, like a Westerner. Clearly this pleased her. What do you think? She'd say, trying out different expressions in the mirror. Don't you think I look like a Westerner when I do this? Apparently she studied the actress's movements when we went to the movies, because she was very good at imitating them. In an instant she could capture the mood and idiosyncrasies of an actress. Pickford laughs like this, she'd say, Pina Menachley moves her eyes like this, Geraldine Farrar does her hair up this way. Loosening her hair, she'd push it into this shape and that. Very good, better than any actor. Your face looks so western. Does it? Where does it look western? Your nose and your teeth. My teeth. She pulled her lips back and studied the row of teeth in the mirror. They were wonderfully straight and glossy. Anyway, you're different from other Japanese, and ordinary Japanese clothes don't do anything for you. How would it be if you wore Western clothes? Or Japanese clothes in some new style? What kind of style? Women are going to be more and more active in the future. Those heavy, tight things they wear now won't do. How about a narrow-sleeved kimono with an informal sash? That'd be fine. Anything's alright as long as you try for original styles. I wonder if there isn't some outfit that's neither Japanese, Chinese, or Western. If there is, will you buy it for me? Of course I will. I'm going to get all sorts of clothes for you, and we'll switch them around every day. You don't need expensive stuff. Muslin and common silk will do. The important thing is to have original designs. After this conversation, we often went to drapers and department stores together to look for fabric. We must have went every Sunday at Mitsukoshi and Shirokiya. But it was hard to find patterns we liked, because neither of us was satisfied with the usual women's things. Run of the mill drapers were of no use to us, so we went to cotton print dealers carpet shops, and stores that specialized in western fabrics. We even went on full day outings to Yokohama, where we dragged ourselves from shop to shop in Chinatown and to dry goods stores in the foreign settlement, foraging for the right fabrics. We studied the outfits of westerners we passed on the street and scrutinized every shop window. If there was something unusual, one of us would cry, look, 
How about that? We'd rush into the shop, have the fabric brought in from the window and see how it looked on Naomi, draping it from her chin and wrapping it around her torso. We had great fun walking around and window shopping this way, even when we didn't buy anything. Nowadays, it's fashionable for women to make summer kimonos out of organdy, georgette, and cotton of oil, but Naomi and I were probably the first to use these fabrics. For some reason the textures were very becoming to her. We weren't interested in conventional kimonos. Instead, she made the material into narrow-sleeved kimonos, pajama suits, and robes that looked like nightgowns. Sometimes she'd simply wrap a bolt of cloth around her body and fasten it with brooches. Dressed in one or another of these outfits, she'd parade around the house, stand in front of the mirror, and pose while I took pictures. Wrapped in gauzy, translucent clothing of white, rose, or pale lavender, she was like a beautiful large blossom in a vase. Try it this way, now this way, I'd say. Picking her up, laying her down, telling her to be seated or to walk, I gazed at her by the hour. Under the circumstances, her wardrobe grew enormously in the space of a year. She couldn't possibly store it all in her room. She hung things or rolled them up in piles everywhere. We could have bought a cabinet, but that would have cut into our clothes budget, and in any case there was no need to treat her clothes that carefully. She had lots of them, but they were all inexpensive and quick to wear out. It was more convenient to spread them around where we could see them and try various combinations whenever we were in the mood. They also served as decoration for the rooms. The atelier was just like a property room at the theatre, with clothes strewn everywhere, on the chairs, on the sofa, in corners, even on the stairs and over the theatre box rail. Most of them were soiled, because Naomi was in the habit of wearing them right against her skin, and we hardly ever laundered them. Most of the designs were so outrageous that she could wear only about half of them outside the house. Her favourite, which she often wore when we went out was a lined, cotton-padded satin kimono with a matching jacket. Both the jacket and the kimono were a solid, reddish-brown, as were the thongs on her sandals and the cord on her jacket. Everything else, the neck piece, the sash fastener, the lining of the under kimono, the sleeve ends, and the trim at the bottom, was pale blue. The narrow sash, too, was made of thinly padded satin. She wound it tightly, high on her chest. For the neck piece, she bought a ribbon, wanting something that looked like satin. She wore this outfit most often when we went to the theatre in the evening. Everyone turned to look as she walked through the lobby of a Yarakuza or the Imperial Theatre in that glistening fabric. I wonder who she is? An actress, maybe. A Eurasian? Hearing the whispers, we'd move proudly toward them. If that outfit amazed people, then Naomi could scarcely have gone out in her more fanciful creations, however much she liked to be unconventional. They were no more than containers, a variety of packages into which I'd put her when we were home, and gaze at her. I suppose it was like trying out a beautiful flower in one vase, then another. There's nothing so surprising about this. While she was my wife, she was also a rare, precious doll and an ornament. She never wore ordinary clothes at home. Her most expensive indoor outfit was a three-piece, black velvet suit that she said was inspired by a costume she'd seen a man wear in an American movie. When she put it on with her hair rolled up under a sports cap, she was as sensuous as a cat. Both summer and winter, when we heated the room with a stove, she often wore nothing but a loose gown or a bathing suit. She had countless pairs of slippers including embroidered ones from China. She always wore them without socks.